Greetings and welcome back, gentlemen and the three and a half ladies who watch this channel. Today we have a very interesting trig integral and in fact there is more than one kind of trig function involved. So we're evaluating the integral from zero to infinity of sine x over hyperbolic sine or sinh of x times cosine of x divided by hyperbolic cosine or cosh x dx. Okay, cool. And I'll just get straight to the solution development over here because this thing is pretty interesting. So the first thing I'd like to do is expand the hyperbolic sine and cosine functions. So we'll write this as integral zero to infinity sine x times cosine x over e to the x minus e to the, ne e to the negative x over 2. And we multiply that by, for the cosh function, we have e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2. And that gives us, in the numerator, notice something that sine x times cosine x is actually 1 half of sine 2x. So we have 1 half of sine 2x divided by e to the 2x minus e to the negative 2x, where we just invoke the identity of a minus b times a plus b, of course divided by 4 dx. Now I'd like to expand by 4 to get rid of that 4 downstairs. So by that token we have twice the integral from 0 to infinity of sine 2x over e to the 2x minus e to the negative 2x dx, which looks pretty cool. And I could invoke a transformation here going from the 2x realm to the x realm and that takes 2dx to the dx realm, which implies that i here, now we have 2 times dx, so that's just the integral from 0 to infinity of sine x over e to the x minus e to the negative x. Okay, cool. And now what? Well, the sine function is part of the complex exponential, so we'll write this thing as the imaginary part of the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the i x over e to the x minus e to the negative x dx. And now we just have a lot of exponential functions to deal with, which is quite nice indeed. But now what? Well, we could invoke a geometric series, but that would require expansion by e to the negative x. So that's exactly what we'll carry out. We have the imaginary part of the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x times e to the i x over e to the negative x times e to the x minus e to the negative x dx. Terribly sorry about that. And that yields the imaginary part of the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x times 1 minus i over 1 minus e to the negative 2x dx. And now for our series expansion, recall that we can expand 1 over 1 minus x as the sum over k from 0 to infinity of x to the k provided that the absolute value of x is less than 1. Now if we replace x here by e to the negative 2x, then of course e to the negative 2x is indeed less than 1 on our interval of integration. So we have 1 over 1 minus e to the negative 2x equal to the sum over k from 0 to infinity of e to the negative 2x to the k, which of course equals e to the negative 2kx. Terribly sorry about that. And that implies that the integral i equals the imaginary part of the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x times 1 minus i times the sum over k from 0 to infinity of e to the negative 2kx and integration with respect to x. Now this term is independent of the index variable k so we take it inside the summation operator and we have the imaginary part of the integral from 0 to infinity of the sum over k from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x times 1 minus i times e to the negative 2kx, which of course we can simplify because we could just factor out an e to the negative x on adding the exponents here. So that means we'll be left with 
1 plus 2k, terribly sorry about that, 1 plus 2k minus i times negative x as the argument of the exponential function. Okay, cool. Now clearly this thing is convergent, so we'll switch up the order of the operators and write this as the imaginary part of the sum over k from 0 to infinity of the integrals from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x times 1 plus 2k again terribly sorry about that minus i dx and the integration here is pretty straightforward so we have the imaginary part of the sum over k from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x times 1 plus 2k minus i and we'll divide this thing by the derivative of the argument which is of course a negative sign outside and we have 1 plus 2k minus i over here with the limits being 0 and infinity. Now what about the limit as x approaches infinity? Well take note of something that we have e to the negative x times 1 plus 2k minus x minus i that is terribly sorry about that and this thing can be expanded as e to the negative x times e to the negative 2kx times, well, e to the negative ix. Now, e to the negative ix is bounded in terms of its modulus. The modulus always equals 1. And these two terms approach 0 as x approaches infinity. Okay, cool. So that means the upper limit, that is the limit as x approaches infinity vanishes to zero and we're only left with a negative sign and the lower limit which implies that i here now equals the two negatives cancelling out and we have the imaginary part of the sum over k from zero to infinity of one over one plus two k minus i of course we're interested in separating this thing into real and imaginary parts so for that purpose we'll expand the argument using the complex conjugate so we have 1 over 1 plus 2k minus i times 1 over 2k plus i divided by 1 over 2k plus i and that gives us the imaginary part of the sum over the non-negative integers k of 1 plus 2k plus i over 1 plus 2k whole thing squared minus i times squared minus i squared that is why did i say i times squared that was that was weird that was a weird blooper anyway so i squared is negative one the two negatives cancel out and we have a plus one over here so taking the imaginary part gives us the sum over k of one over one plus two k squared plus one okay cool now, how exactly do we evaluate the sum? Well, let's invoke complex numbers again and write plus one here as negative i squared. In other words, we have the sum over k of one over one plus two k squared minus i squared. So we'll write this as the sum over k of 1 over 1 plus 2k plus i again and 1 plus 2k minus i and just invoke a partial fraction decomposition which is pretty straightforward here because one term is supposed to be something over 1 plus 2k plus i and then we need 1 plus 2k minus i and a negative sign should work over here and take note of something that in this case if we just have ones then that would mean we have wait i should place this negative sign over here positive sign over here then we have yeah i plus i which is 2i so to balance things out we need 1 over 2i outside and now how exactly do we evaluate this thing well the first thing i'd like to do is factor out Let's factor out 2 from here somehow. And by somehow, I'm just going to write it because that's a lot easier to explain. So we have 1 over 2i times the sum over k of 1 over... Okay, so we got 2 factored out. We're left with k plus 1 minus i over 2 minus 
1 over 2 times k plus 1 plus i over 2 and that yields 1 over 4i times the sum over k of 1 over k plus 1 minus i over 2 minus 1 over k plus 1 plus i over 2. Well, it's that time of the year where I invoke special functions, which is every time of the year, I guess. Anyway, that's not important. The important thing is that we have the digamma function, which has this really awesome looking series expansion. It equals negative Euler Mascheroni constant plus the sum over k from 0 to infinity of 1 over k plus 1 minus 1 over k plus the argument z that we plug into it. So what if we were to take the difference of digamma of z1 and digamma of z2? So we have digamma z1, terribly sorry about that, minus digamma z2. Obviously, the euler mascheroni constant would cancel out. And the same case for this common k, 1 over k plus 1 term. And you'll be left with the sum over k from 0 to infinity of 1 over k plus z1, rather negative sign here. So negative sign here, two negatives canceling out, and then we have 1 over k plus z2. Okay, cool, which is exactly the kind of pattern we're looking for. So this implies that, tar that the target integral i equals 1 over 4i times the difference of digamma functions. So we're supposed to have this thing positive, which is this thing. So that's our z2. In other words, we have digamma of 1 minus i over 2 minus digamma of 1 plus i over 2. And, oh, wait a minute. I've actually gotten it mixed up. Yeah, this is supposed to be 1 plus i over 2, and this thing 1 minus i over 2. Yeah, that makes perfect sense now. Okay, cool. So now we have a difference of digamma functions with complex arguments. And that's quite nice to work with. How is that quite nice to work with? Well, if you look at the arguments, we have 1 over 4i times digamma of... 1 plus i over 2 is equal to 1 minus 1 minus i over 2, and that's exactly what's helpful. Because now we can invoke the reflection formula for the digamma function, which can easily be derived from the reflection formula of the, of the gamma function. That is, if you have gamma z times gamma 1 minus z equal to pi times the cosecant of pi times z, then this implies on by taking the logarithm first and then differentiating this whole thing with respect to z, that we have the logarithmic derivative, terribly sorry about that, of the, diga of the gamma function, that is the logarithmic derivative of the gamma function being the digamma function. So that means we just have log gamma z plus log gamma one minus z and differentiating that means we have gamma z plus gamma 1 minus z. Terribly sorry about that. But because of the chain rule, the derivative of 1 minus z is, of course, negative 1. So we have a negative sign here. And this thing equals, well, we have log pi, which is differentiated to 0. And you need the derivative of log of cosecant pi z, which is, of course, 1 over cosecant pi times z times negative cosecant pi z times cotangent pi z times, of course, pi because of the chain rule again. The cosecants cancel out. And finally, we have digamma 1 minus z minus digamma z equal to pi times the cotangent of pi times z. Terribly sorry if that felt a bit rushed. I've derived this many, many times in previous videos. Okay, cool. So all of that implies that i here equals 1 over 4i times the cotangent of pi times 1 minus i over 2. 
And of course, we can simplify this further using a bit more complex analysis. So we have one over four i. Wait, I said we can simplify this further using a bit more complex analysis. If, if I were to utter such a sentence in front of someone who is, who doesn't have that kind of a background in mathematics, they would be like, "What do you mean simplify by a complex analysis? Or how do simplify and complex even go together?" Yeah, math is awesome. I cannot stress this enough that math is just so damn awesome. And finally, we have the cotangent of pi over 2 minus i times pi over 2. And we know that the phase shift of pi over 2 turns it into the tangent. So we have 1 over 4i times the tangent of i pi over 2. And we know that tangent of i z is i times hyperbolic tangent. So we have 1 over 4i. And I'm forgetting something, aren't I? Yeah, I forgot the pi. I thought something was off. Terribly sorry about that. I'm pretty sure someone has already commented this. So in that case, thank you for the comment boost. So we have i times hyperbolic tangent of pi over 2. The i's cancel out. The answer is indeed a real number. And we have this pretty gorgeous looking result that the integral from 0 to infinity of sine x over sinh x times cosine x over cosh x dx equals pi over 4 times the hyperbolic tangent of pi over 2. So yeah, you've got pi's over there and you have various different types of trig functions, which does seem fitting indeed. Again, math is awesome. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.